everyone, it's Ross. In today's video, we're gonna be planting out some seedlings. Um, the spring's here. Things are growing. Um, you know, the, the ground has warmed up enough. It isn't frozen, um, and it's giving us that temperature to really get our cool oven crops transplanted into the ground, um, really get things going here. It's, it's about the, I think it's the 18th of March. So, uh, we're not really into the, the really safe territory as I would think, which is probably April 1st. Um, that's usually when I plant my cool oven crops. Uh, May 1st is our last frost, but around April or March 15th, that was my ideal goal this year to get things out into the garden um, and also start things indoors. And this is really what I'm thinking here is a really great day and a great time to be planting these things. It's gonna obviously depend on your climate and what's going on in the, in, you know, around you, you know? Figure out what the forecast is like. Um, these are my cool oven crops, as I've said, and these are the things that are gonna do well for me very early in the year, okay? Um, you know, these are things like lettuces, arugula, chard, um, kale, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, carrots, turnips, you know, all kinds of root crops, beets. Um, even, I even planted potatoes this weekend. Um, we're even doing lots of Asian greens here that I'm gonna show you guys in just a moment. Things like uh, Chinese broccoli, or even Italian broccoli, rapini. Um, mizuna we're doing, which is a, like a mustard green. Um, we're also doing things like komatsuna and tatsoi, which are kind of like bok choy, but used for their leaves and they're much more hardier and can kind of handle the colder conditions. Um, believe it or not, bok choy, you would think it's pretty hardy. It probably is, but the plant bolts at really cold temperatures. So we're gonna have a whole different set of vegetables that I'm gonna be trying to cultivate in the summer um, versus right now, which is really for the spring. And even a lot of this stuff that we're gonna have here, I can even get this throughout the entirety of the year. Uh, which is really going to be awesome. A lot of this stuff is probably going to be in the ground from today, the 18th of March, maybe even until December. Um, if I keep up with this, I continually plant these things, some of this may just survive that much cold and won't bolt. You know, there really is some things out there, especially these Asian vegetables. Swiss chard is my longest lived crop. Um, that stuff lives in my yard from now until actually this year, it was in well into, into December. Um, it was kind of incredible. So we're gonna get a lot of this stuff planted out and I wanna just uh, bring you guys along for this and show you guys exactly what I'm doing here. These are, this is one of the trays here that we started indoors and it's been hardening off and uh, some of it doesn't actually look too great. Um, I think we hardened this off maybe a bit too fast. We didn't take our time. We got another bed over there or I should say another bin over there, another tray. And that tray looks great, um, except some of the snap peas on the end are a bit scorched by the sun. It's really not that big of a deal, I think. Um, we've also prepared this bed. This is a three foot wide bed. I think it's somewhere around, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 feet. I can't remember exactly. Now I do have my phone here. And my phone has my spreadsheet in it. It has my garden plans exactly listed out so that if I get confused and not really sure what I'm doing in this space, I don't really have to think about it because all I have to do is go to my phone and my spreadsheet because you guys should have been planning this whole time. And I can just look at that and put things in here exactly where they go and where I had planned to put them. Um, and this actually, this area here underneath this tray is going to be something called Yacone. Um, it's going to take up about a three foot by three foot space. And then in this section here is all kinds of potatoes that we just planted. Specifically a variety called German Butterball. We have some German Butterball planted there as well as there. We're probably going to plant, as we always do, our soybeans here for edamame underneath the grapevines. They work, well, they work out really well there every single year. Even though they're in like only probably five hours or even less of light. Um, I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do because I have a whole area over here underneath the peaches that could be of use. 
we have this whole bed here which is mainly going to be for the warm loving crops like potato or i'm sorry not potatoes like tomatoes and uh, peppers and those kind of things right we're going to be growing most of that vertically in these beds um but i could make use of that from now until about mid-may because mid-may is really when the ground starts to really warm up probably get to like 60 degrees fahrenheit and at 60 degrees fahrenheit a lot of those cool loving or those warm loving crops those heat loving crops really start to actually grow before that they don't really do much they kind of just sit in the ground and do nothing so you know i'm expecting actually for most of these cool loving crops not to do a whole lot unless the ground is quite warm but uh i think it's pretty decent right now i would say probably like 40 45 maybe even 50 degrees depending on the time of the day uh, depending on the day uh, itself as well but let's get to planting here kind of a uh, quit talking I'm gonna put you guys down give you guys a little bit of a bird's eye view if I can get you guys to stand up straight this is sort of annoying Oh man, what a disaster. Okay, we're gonna have you guys looking at me, I guess. So we'll get our tray here. And what are we planting in this section here? Well, we've kind of narrowed it down to about each square foot. This is about a, this is about a foot right here. Is gonna have one crop in it, and it's gonna go down this way. And then the next square foot over here is gonna have another crop in it. This one here, we according to the spreadsheet, is going to have tatsoi. So we're going to pop this out of the tray. Hopefully this is somewhat easy. It doesn't look like it's going to be. We have these cells that are 100 and, 128 cells per tray. And this is the first year I'm using something like this. So we'll see how this works out. It doesn't seem to come out very easily. There we go can see here and I know you're in the shadow which really really stinks there we go you can barely see any roots but they're there and actually the roots don't really look that healthy that's pretty disappointing to see but we're gonna plop this in here um, and in actuality we're gonna try to get this pretty deep um, we're gonna cover up the stems of these plants because they may be a little lanky, that's not you know, the worst thing in the world because we can just cover them up. I'm really struggling to get these things out of here. I gotta pull them from the top and that's really not good. Now Komatsuna, I'm sorry, this is Tatsoi that we're planting right now. And Komatsuna as well, they're kind of very similar Asian greens in that they're like a, similar to a bok choy. They get different sizes, probably have different flavors, but they're used for their leaves. They're not really used for their stems in the, in the sense that some bok choy could be used kind of in the way that you would use a cabbage. But I think this is a pretty decent spacing. I've never grown these before. I've never grown tatsoi before. This is the first year we're doing it. Ah, oh, that's easier. I think I really have to change my technique a little bit and this will be a lot easier we're just really making this making a hole here and just slipping this in with the hori hori i don't know if you guys got a chance to see what i just did but i'll do it over here we just stuck our hori hori in did that a little bit and now we've got ourselves a hole and then over here we're now covering this up that's it i don't even have to really tamp this down if i don't want Come in here again. I'll turn you guys one more time. We'll just slip that guy in there. And that's it. It's pretty nice because I'm able to do this. These aren't the most strongest plants, okay? I'm gonna admit that right now. Um, but it's nice because these guys will transplant easier when they're smaller. Also, um, they're not really gonna have a difficult time um, dealing with the conditions they're pretty young 
they're really not struggling to even harden off um, they're just now showing their true leaves and you know what this is a great idea because we've got these plants in here to the point where uh, they're gonna basically do really really well for us I mean that's really I think essentially what I wanted to say is that uh, these plants really are not gonna have trouble adjusting we said that um, But also, we're able to start the seeds indoors, right? That's, I think that's what I wanted to mention, is that by starting them indoors, we're able to transplant them out earlier. So if I were to direct seed right now, or maybe a week from now, we have all this time that we've put into these seedlings here. We have that in the form of these seedlings. So we're basically, essentially, two weeks ahead of the game um, by doing this, is really what we're gaining. Um, I could, of course, direct seed this, and I've seen some direct seeds that I've done in the past versus my transplants. Direct seeding is usually king. Um, but if you give these plants enough of a head start, and some of them, if you give them some nice size as well, it's really going to pay off in the long run. We're going to come over here and get this last, this last one in right here. I want to mention about this raised bed is that we just created this. What we did was we threw on compost. We put on my just natural potting soil. This stuff is 50% compost and 50% pine bark. There's other things in here because we got this soil actually from another raised bed and, and relocated the soil. But uh, there's also other things in here, other amendments. There's also some inorganic fertilizer. Um, there's also rice holes. You can very clearly see that. We have just random straw. It's not perfect. There's probably even some peat moss in here. But this soil is fantastic for transplanting or direct seeding. This is really what you want to focus on. In no way do you guys want to just take off, take off the grass and plant directly into that. Um, I think you really need a nice little buffer here on top of the native clay that we have. Really loosen up the top layer of the soil. And also, it's really going to encourage a lot of nutrients. Um, really some well draining, also some aeration to these young plants. And that's really all this is, is that we're trying to give these guys the best shot that they can get. So we'll do more of them here for you guys. We're gonna do, uh, that was tat soy. We're gonna do komatsuna next. I know you guys like to watch this stuff. I personally like to watch this stuff. Um, but it really isn't the most interesting thing all the time. But I'm happy to show it to you guys. Because I know that if I was starting out, this is the kind of thing that I'd be looking for. These are much more healthier roots, it seems. Now, we need to thin these out as well. Um, so in time, I'm going to come in here and thin out what I need to thin out. Because we haven't thinned this out one little bit. But we're going to go over another square foot and do this whole thing over again. Now, what I've... What I think I understand about Komatsuna is that it's a smaller plant than, let's say, the Tatsoi. So I think I can get away with, or maybe the way that I'm growing it is going to be more compact. I can't remember the exact details. I've never, I've never grown these things. So we're kind of doing this on the fly here. And if there is any mistakes, we can always come back and adjust this. now. The tat soil that we planted, um, I think we're gonna multi-sow this. We're not actually gonna thin this out. We're gonna let them grow in clumps. And each of them will kind of push each other away from each other and, and grow in their own little space. You know, and um, that way they can kind of, they can do that, right? Certain plants will be able to do that. Others, maybe like the Komatsuna, cannot. So I'm not entirely sure. And let's say I make a mistake big deal right 
I'll learn and then next year we'll fix it and do it the right way next year, right? It's not really the biggest deal. Um, I think a lot of you guys worry for, for no reason. Um, we've also got a lot of plants in this tray that probably will not get planted in the ground. We over sowed, over seeded this stuff. But it's good because if we actually have a problem where we're missing plants, we can just stick them in anywhere we want. And I'm gonna try to keep these plants growing just in case something does happen, right? So I'm just kind of sticking this in here, guys, if you can see that. There's not really anything to this, you know? I actually find this very joyful. Hopefully you guys are still with me from watching this from the beginning. Um, there's a lot of chit-chat in the beginning. I feel like there's some really key points to this, even though it may look easy, and it may definitely, it is easy to, to me at this point because I've been doing this long enough. But there is some finer points that I feel like if you guys miss, you're get, your life is gonna be a lot harder when you're doing this. I'm actually gonna take these out of the tray. I think it just, it just makes it easier if I take them all out at once instead of going through the hassle of planting it and then going back to the tray. Now, what are the finer points that I'm talking about here? This one didn't come out of the tray very nice. And that's a shame, but in actuality, we could stick this back in, now that I think about it. <laughs> Poor plants. <laughs> because we have plenty of space here. Come around the other side of the bed. You guys are in the shade a little bit. Sorry for that. But what are the finer points here? I think the finer points here with anything you guys grow is the soil. Without a doubt, 100% will always be the soil, whether that's in a container, in the ground, a fruit tree, a house plant. A well-draining soil is what you want. You want air to be able to reach these really thin roots. If you don't have airflow, these plants really will suffocate and they won't be very happy. Um, also, it really helps with the adequate amount of water. Too much water or too little water is the main reason why plants die. So if you're not doing this from the beginning with the right soil, you're going into this the wrong way. Now I gotta go to my spreadsheet here because I don't remember what's next. But I'm gonna open this up, I'm gonna show it to you guys. Maybe you guys can see this. But if you go in the description of the video, you'll see the spreadsheet here. We've got Tatsoi here, Komatsuna, Mizuna is next. So we'll do Mizuna, and then next to that is Mokum Carrots. And uh, Mokum Carrots, one of my favorite carrots by far. In fact, I still have some in the ground that have been overwintering, believe it or not. Let me give you guys a shot of this, me trying to get the Mizuna out of the tray. Basically coming out from underneath here and pressing this and going higher and then it's coming out. This one really doesn't look very good. All the Mizuna really looks quite bad. So I may have to eventually direct seed this. You can see here's one little plant that doesn't seem to really be liking life and I may just put him down for now and see what we can we can make do with over here because these guys do not look good certain plants uh, I think the Mizuna for whatever reason out of all everyone it's Ross and uh, today's video I want to show you guys the greenhouse I want to show you guys how it's all looking right now at this point of the year um, things really haven't woken up um, that quickly it takes about a week maybe even uh, 15 days but here it is and you can see there's a lot of green in here particularly from these pomegranates man they just leaf out like nuts and I'm out here right now filming for you guys because every day I have to come out here and open up this door because the heater 
keeps things at nighttime about 60 degrees. And then when the sun comes in about midday, even earlier than midday, sometime around 10, um, it really warms this greenhouse up. And temperatures right now, if I had a guess, without looking at the thermometer, I would say temperatures are probably a almost 100 degrees right now. Um, you can see there's a lot of things leafing out and there's a lot of Brava in here, which I'm very surprised to see on a lot of these varieties that I wasn't really expecting. I have a feeling some of this may be um, like maybe an overwintered main crop, you know, a main crop that never really formed in time and they kind of just lay dormant in the tree. Like look at this one. This is strawberry verte. This is three figs two of which is in the same node I have a really strong feeling that uh, one of these is a Brava and one of these is a main crop that was there from last year I've, I've never really seen two Brava on the same node so this is kind of really telling me the full picture we also have things like LSU Scott's black which have three Brava on this branch another maybe even four Brava on this branch here um, and that's not even the entirety of the tree. So uh, I don't, I've never seen so much Brava on one tree before. And if I take you guys around the back, there's actually a tree that you can kind of see through the, through the, the uh, plastic here. I'm not sure if you guys can see this, but there's one, two, three back behind the branch, four, five, five Brava, six Brava up there as well on this one branch. And I can't even, I'm not even sure what tree this is. I think that's St. Martin. It's supposed to be one of the hardiest varieties in existence, believe it or not. But uh, I think that's St. Martin back there just by knowing what my St. Martin tree looks like. but. I mean, look at this foliage on this on this pomegranate. They all look like this at this point. And the pomegranates are always the first thing to wake up. You'll also notice that we did indeed take off the tarp on the top. And the tarp's here on the side just sitting here. Um, I don't foresee myself needing the tarp again. But if there is a night for whatever reason that dips down into like the mid-teens, then I'm probably going to want to put that tarp on there at night to keep this greenhouse more insulated. Um, we also had to come in here and tape down that window because it was pretty much exposed. You can see it's still exposed. The tape's only doing so much. But that's really not the biggest deal because I gotta come out here anyway and open this up, you know? So uh, this heater does shut off at the temperature I've set it at, but um, it seems to still put out a really small amount of air at higher temperatures, which really accelerates the heat that gets trapped in here, um, especially when it's already at 60, then the sun comes in. The sun's gonna easily raise the temperature in the greenhouse. If it's really strong, um, it's blasting on the uh, greenhouse all day, like there's no clouds. You're, you could probably expect easily 40 to 50 degrees increase in the greenhouse. So I'm trying to keep things somewhere around 85, I think is probably the best temperature. For waking these things up though, you may wanna um, really blast the temperature to really say, all right guys, you gotta wake up, you know? It's like kind of how I would say, you know, in, in like old movies, in like war movies where they play that trumpet, whatever the hell that trumpet music is. <laughs> and everybody just gets way up and it's like at the crack of dawn, you know, it's like, I don't know. But anyway, point is, it's kind of the same way with the temperature is that you're blasting them with this temperature and it gives them a nice little wake up call. I would say this greenhouse, we only woke it up we started putting on the heater with the intention of waking the trees up sometime around the 5th of March. And today is like the 19th. So we haven't really even, they haven't really even done anything. It hasn't really been that much time. I mean, it really does take about a week, week and a half for those trees to wake up. So now that they've waken up, they're really gonna start taking off. 
what we need to do soon is come in here with the water um, sometime probably in the next two weeks and just give everything a nice squirt down especially if things are getting too hot in there so that's really it um, I guess the figs on the patio here this little experiment that we're doing this year we're taking out the figs out onto the patio these are dormant dormant trees except some of these have kind of broken bud you can see that right there they're trying to break bud it seems like but they haven't really done anything and I think it really is because the nighttime temperatures here are very cold still and because those nighttime temperatures even they're even below 32 um, it's not really making a big difference in when these trees wake up so that's really good I want them to stay dormant for a while um, you know kind of do their thing here on the patio and hopefully they're gonna wake up sometime around late April you know May 1st at the latest and we'll have a really nice way of bringing these trees out here onto the patio someone had mentioned that uh, I think in the video that I did someone had said I did this before and it didn't work out for me um, a lot of my trees got hit with the cold and I lost a lot of growth uh, because I'm assuming that person their trees had leafed out and because their trees had leafed out and started growing yeah of course if you let those trees that have active growth on them leaves swollen buds if you let that get hit with a really cold temperature you're gonna lose some growth you're gonna lose that that growth's also gonna be damaged too so do yourself a favor and don't do this if your trees are awake I made that abundantly clear in that video so anyway guys Thank you so much for watching this one. Um, we'll catch you for tomorrow's video, all right? You guys can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter now. We have a whole bunch of different content over there, as well as the website, rossratty.wixsite.com slash blog. We have a nice blog post there. We also have consulting services that we're offering up people. Uh, there's all kinds of links there to the plants, to the cuttings, to the, you know, all kinds of things that are being sold. Um, we are selling right now actually we're going to be selling some cuttings and we're also going to be selling some raspberry plants that we dug up they're already on fig bid the the raspberry plants I need to get the um, I need to get the cuttings though on the fig bid and you guys can go there from the link in the description we're gonna have all kinds of varieties here that I'm gonna trim and the reason I'm gonna trim them is because I realized for this storage area here, it's only so tall and I'd rather have them kind of branch out from a lower point because of that. So we're gonna end up pruning these guys quite heavily, I think, even lower than what some of these are and get them to branch out this spring at a lower height. And that means a lot of cuttings for you guys, for whoever wants to be grafting, whoever wants to do late season rooting, if you wanna do outdoor rooting, you guys can do this. So. Alrighty, I'll talk to everyone soon. I'll see you for tomorrow's video. Take care, guys.